this afternoon we have a good many requests here we'll go we'll go over the announcements first remember this Tuesday brother Louise will be preaching this coming Saturday will be Bible study and then we'll have communion and everything on on Sunday the 7th remember our church dinner is the 14th this side's got dessert this side's got rolls dessert rolls dessert rolls just remember that I guess whatever Whatever they're bringing, meat and, meat and one vegetable, meat and two vegetables. Meat and two vegetables. So just remember that. Both sides. Meat and two vegetables, but this side's got to bring a dessert also, and this side's got to bring rolls. Remember that. November the 14th, like I said, we'll be having only one service. November the 23rd, we will be having service, which is a Tuesday before Thanksgiving. And on that Wednesday, we always call it off. And we have it on Tuesday instead of Wednesday. So just remember that. Let's see. We'll go over. Sister Christine had blurred vision, vision this morning. That's why she's not here. Still remember Anna Marunga and their family all down with the strip. Remember that. Her sister Mary that was here this morning, like uh, Brother Aaron had mentioned, she's got a job interview tomorrow with the uh, University of Georgia, so she'd like for you, your prayers for that. Susan gave me one. No, this is also if you want a Boston butt, you need to get with Susan today. Today's the last day to get it ordered and give her the money. It's 40 bucks if you want one. So just remember that. Sister Charlotte gave me a couple. It says, my friend Pauline Green's husband has spots on his liver. May have to go through chemo again. She's asking everyone to pray. So remember that brother right there. He needs a touch from the Lord. Also, Charlotte also gave me one to continue to pray for. Sarah's mom, Trish. Uh, her biopsy shows uh, stage four colon cancer. No treatment or options yet. So remember that young lady too as we pray also. So that's the ones I have. I know we, Anna and them are traveling. They're on their way back. If nobody don't know, they're, they're on their way back from the camp. So keep them in your prayers. They should be here. I don't know, three or four o'clock, I guess. Sometime they'll be here. So if you're picking up your kids, stick around and they'll be here. Don't leave without them. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ryan on them's already took off. He left Mercy a car here. He's just leaving. So I don't know what he's got in plans, but that's okay. We'll get her home. And I know we all have unspoken requests. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for letting us come out this afternoon, Lord. Lord, be with the ones that are traveling. Remember, Anna and all the ones traveling back from the, the uh, youth. Get together there, Lord. Be with them and bless them. Keep them safe on the highways. Lord, there's many other requests that we have mentioned here, Lord, from this morning and this afternoon, Lord, that many people need a touch from you. We know of many other ones, Lord, that we need that need prayer. Come down and bless them today. Bless all of our unspoken requests. Be with them. Be with Brother Bob. Strengthen him, Lord. Be with a way to be traveling also this afternoon also, Lord. Be with us in God. Forgive us for all of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You be seated.
We on? All right. Praise the Lord. Um, I know we're kind of few in number, but uh, I want to say I appreciate the Lord and uh, getting the opportunity to, to do this. I, I do enjoy doing this. And uh, the cicadas haven't come back around since I got to do this. So, uh, you know, it's uh, 15, 20 years or whatever. You get to do it once. And, uh, so I got to fill in again today. So I want to thank the Lord for that. So y'all just help me out this afternoon. But, uh, I want to sing this little song. Uh, I don't know if we got it in the small in the song books, but I think most everybody knows the song. I'm redeemed by love divine. It's in the key of G. Mm-hmm. Sweet is the song I'm singing today. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Trouble and sorrow have vanished away. For I have been. I have been redeemed, oh, I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine, all to end. I now resign, for I have been, I have been redeemed. Great is my joy as onward I go. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, all the way homeward, my praises shall flow, for I have been, I have been redeemed, oh I'm redeemed, by love divine, glory, glory, Christ is mine. indeed is my Savior to me. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, happy and glory someday I shall be. For I have been, I have been redeemed, oh I'm redeemed, my love is mine all do it I now resign for I have been I have been redeemed yes I'm redeemed by love divine glory glory Christ is mine all do it I now resign for I me say they're glad to be redeemed. Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to sing number 124 in the spiral book. Just a little closer walk with thee. It's B flat. I am weak, but thou art strong. Keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee and just a closer.
and through this world of tolls and snares. If I fall to Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but is my plea and daily walking close to thee let it be dear Lord let it be and when my feeble life is old Let's all stand. Have Brother Jonas, if I can get you, come we'll receive the tithes and the offering this afternoon. Amen. As we Amen. Amen. Sing this. I believe it's in this one. It's number uh, two seventeen in the in the red hymnal. It's uh, just over in the glory land. G. G. Hmm. Of a home prepared where the saints abide, just over in the glory land, and I long to be by my Savior's side, just over in the Just 
just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land. There went that mighty host I'll stand. Just over in the glory land. What a wonderful thought that my Lord I'll see. Just over in the glory land. There with kindred safe, there forever be. Just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land. I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the I'll stand just over in the glory land. With the blood washed throng, I will shout and sing just over in the glory land. Glad hosannas to Christ the Lord and King just over in the glory land. Just over Looking toward that wonderful day. Yes. We're going to be gathered all together. Amen. Let's sing. Go to Kia C. Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people to come and die. With his man, he defeat and supplies our every need. Is sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. Come and dine, the master called to come and dine. Oh, you may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry call of now, come and dine. The disciples came to land. Command for the master called unto them, Come and die. There they found their heart's desire, bread and fish upon the fire. Thus he satisfies the hungry every time. Oh, come and dine, the master called, Come and die. For oh, you may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude. Soon the Lamb will take his bride to be ever at his side. All the host of heaven will assemble be. Oh, it will be a glorious sight, all the saints and spotless white. And with Jesus they will feast eternally. Oh, come and dine, the Master calleth, come and dine. At Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry call of now, come and dine. Yes, come and dine. Master call of come and dine. Oh, you may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry call of now, come and die. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I was looking for Sister Esther. I didn't think she must be in the back. 
She's coming? Okay. Well, the sisters have a song, so we're going to... Uh, we just wait on them for a minute. But uh, Sing number uh, 45 there in the, in the spiral book. Leaning on the everlasting arm. It's in the key of uh, G. 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 What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting someone that we can lean on, we can turn to, amen, amen. turn over to number 51 there, we'll be in the key of Jean. down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood of to the 
this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His wonderful name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to His name. Amen. We have Sister Rachel and Sister Monica come. For the special, we'll just sing this one more time as they come. I'm singing glory to His name. Glory to His wonderful name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. at Jesus when he said she's only sleeping as he took her by the hand she began to live again some began to praise the Lord some began to say he's in the house death has to flee Darkness used, used to be. Now there is hope. There's no more doubt. Praise His name. Praise His name. He's in the house. We were like that little girl, dead in all our sins. Till Jesus took this heart of mine and gave me life again. I am just a house of clay. Ever since that blessed day, there's a light that shines in me for all the world to see. He's in the house. Death has to flee. Now there is life where darkness used to be. Now there is hope. There's no more doubt. Praise His name. Praise His name. He's in the house. Death has to flee. can say he's in the house. Amen. Amen. He's in our house. If that's what he wants. He wants to have residence. He wants us to give him the preeminence. So. Amen. I'm so glad that he's here. Wherever, wherever you welcome him, he's there. 
He always yes, keeps all of his appointments. Right. Ready to hear the word this afternoon. Amen. Looking forward to Brother Bob enjoying the Sunday school and everything. And looking forward to it. Just pull on the word. Amen. God will answer whatever you have need of. Amen. Let's sing. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Lord, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Sing it to him now. Oh, I want to see you. To see you. our desire this afternoon, isn't it? Good to be in the house of the Lord. How many enjoyed that sermon this morning? That was a, that was a little masterpiece. <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes it, uh, it's a little bit of a struggle getting a sermon and getting the mind of the Lord, but uh, sometimes he has to squeeze it out of us and, <laughs> and uh, a masterpiece comes out. But sure, I sure got a blessing out of that this morning. <clears throat> Well, this afternoon we want to talk to you um, uh, about uh, Joshua from Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 to 15, and we'll just uh, take a little topic, uh, the miracle of life, and talk about miracles and talk about life. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we're so grateful to be able to gather around your word this afternoon, Lord Jesus. We just ask, Lord, that you'll be with Brother Wade where he is preaching, Lord Jesus. Be with us now, Lord God, as we open up the doors of our hearts, Lord Jesus, and Lord, that you can just feel at liberty to move among us, Lord Jesus. I know, Lord, this afternoon many I have many have needs, Lord. We're we're needy people, Lord Jesus. We come to you looking, Lord Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, Lord God. That maybe this afternoon you give us what we have need of, Lord Jesus. That we could we could see a little miracle in our life, Lord Jesus, because we know that you're still a miracle working God. You're still a healer. You're still a deliverer. You're still a Savior, Lord God, and we come with our expectations this afternoon, Lord Jesus, and lay them at your feet, Lord Jesus, knowing and confessing, Lord Jesus, that you're still able to to come and meet our needs, Lord Jesus. You're a need-answering God. Lord, we know that the answer to every need that we have is laying here in your word, Lord Jesus. And I pray, God, that you'll just let it rise from the pages, Lord Jesus, to meet every need that we have this afternoon in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It is a little bit hot up here. I'm going to go ahead and take this off. Joshua chapter 10. And it says, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, or uh, Gabon. I, I did look up the pronunciation. <laughs> and believe it or not, it's Gabon. <laughs> <laughs> and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the pit people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it. 
that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. Now think about that. That the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. That a man would speak some words. And nature would have to obey what that man spoke. For the Lord fought for Israel. And Joshua returned and all Israel with him unto the camp to Gilgal. You may be seated. The Lord has a blessing to the reading of the word. <coughs> so so uh, that's maybe a, an odd topic to take out of that scripture, the miracle of life. But I want to te- uh, I, I want to uh, maybe take it just kind of thought a thought for a few minutes on on what a, a miracle is and and, you know, how life is a miracle. And, you know, we live in a time when when people don't believe in miracles anymore. It seems like. Uh, maybe maybe you sitting here this afternoon have, have kind of like Brother Aaron was preaching on this morning. You, the devil begins to put thoughts in your mind and you begin to kind of lose lose sight of the fact that God is still a miracle working God. And, and there's more to the message than just learning things that we, we believe in a miracle working God. We believe in a God that can affect change in our lives. We believe in a God that can change your family, that can change your home. We believe in a God that can come on the scene and heal you and Take uh, whatever problem you've got, whether it's uh, problems with your hip or problems with your feet or problems with your head or wherever, wherever your problems are in your body, that God can touch, touch those problems and meet that need because he, he's still a miracle working God. And how do we know he's a miracle working God? Because he's still the same. And we, we know that's one of the most profound scriptures that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever because... We know that if he, if he, the way that he acted when Brother Branham was here, the way that he acted when Jesus was here, the way that he acted when Joshua stood and spoke to the moon and the sun, we know that he's still the same today that he was back then. Y'all, excuse me, I feel like I tapped into something. Now, now, Brother Branham, when he preached the sermon, The Paradox, and, and, and he began to talk about how he, he kind of started off that sermon with, he talked about how the, there was this brother that he kept coming for interviews with him, and he, kept, he, he wanted to be delivered of cigarettes. Now, you think about that. Now, he was coming to church, and he had a problem with smoking cigarettes, but he knew God was a miracle-working God, but yet within himself, he just could not get rid of the cigarettes. And Brother Branham said that he had like, I think Brother Branham said he had like 50 interviews or, or uh, you, you know, he, he kept coming to Brother Branham over and over or, or trying, maybe it was trying to schedule an interview. He tried over and over to get an interview and time after time he couldn't get an interview, but he knew that if he could just get, get to Brother Branham, why? Why get to Brother Branham? Because <laughs> Brother Branham had a way that he could talk. Listen, I, I want to just uh, lay this out to you. So many times we think that Brother Branham had something that we don't have access to today. We still have access to that same God. If we can believe today, God is still a miracle working God, despite the fact that Brother Branham is off the scene, despite the fact that we don't have access to Jesus in the flesh, we still have a miracle working God, even though he's still the same. Now, now, his problem was he just needed to believe. And when he finally got that audience with Brother Branham and he got sat in there, and I don't know what Brother Branham told him, but he find, Brother Branham said after trying all the psychology, he finally got his miracle. What was his miracle? His miracle was he had tried and tried and tried to lay down the cigarettes. And finally, the cigarette problem was gone. You see what a miracle life is? When, when the life of Christ takes hold in you, it cha- it'll change you. It'll take those cigarettes and take all the drugs and take the alcohol and take the bad attitude and take the, take the horrible spirit and take the argumentative stuff and take it all away from you and change you. That's what a miracle life is. Is. That's what a miracle the life of Christ is. And uh, it's a miracle when your chains are broken, when you're chained down by depression and, and agony and you think nobody cares about you and then life comes on this life, the life of Christ and sets you free. That is a miracle. And Brother Ram said it's a, par- it's a paradox when something incredible without a reasonable explanation happens. It seems incredible, but yet it's true. And you know what a paradox is? It's a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense. 
and yet is perhaps true. And it's a paradox to think that the life of Christ can come into a person and make them lay their cigarettes down and never pick them up again, make them lay their bad habits down to change somebody from some being a horrible backwards person to somebody that's a real Christian coming to church wanting to serve God. That's a paradox, and you can't explain it by reason. You can't explain it by scientific. You can't explain it by, by making a list of all the things that you know with your own knowledge, but it's something that's past understanding, past finding out when God comes on the scene with his life, changes the situation. That's what a paradox is. Brother Ram said, now according to Webster, a paradox is something that seems incredible, but it's true. Therefore, a paradox then would be the same as a miracle. A paradox is the same as a miracle. A paradox is when something that seems like it just couldn't be, the knowledge of the human mind, it's altogether incredible, but yet it's proven true. Do you, do you see why, Christian? You've got to have faith to believe in a miracle. You can't, you, you, you're looking to the unseen. You're looking past the things that your natural eye can see. We believe in miracles. I still believe in miracles. And if you need a miracle this afternoon, there's a way that you can get it. There's a way that you can get whatever you have need of because we believe in a miracle miracle working God. A God that can touch you with. He's touched by the feeling of infirmities. And this God can touch back. He touches back by his word. He speaks back. And he can reach out and heal you whatever your need is. Whatever your problem is this afternoon. He's, he's still a miracle working God. He said now a miracle will be the same thing for a miracle cannot be explained. A miracle is something that happens and you cannot explain it. That makes it a paradox. It's incredible, but yet it's the truth. And you are, you are a miracle. See, now look, looking out on the audience here, I'm looking at a lot of miracles. I'm, it's a miracle that you're even here. Because you didn't come here by your reason or by the, your knowledge, but you came here because the life of Christ called you and tugged at you and moved you, tugged at you like Hattie Wright's. When Hattie Wright spoke that word over her children and the spirit of the Lord began to move on her kids and tugged them and moved them. You're, you're here because something got a hold of you and put you in this pew. You heard the word preached and the life of God came on the scene and moved over your life and caused that seed that you received to come up and move Moved, moved you into this pew and that makes you a miracle. You say, well, Brother Bob, I don't know if God does miracles anymore, but you're, a, you're proof that he still works miracles. You're proof sitting here that God still works miracles. Amen. Brother Bram said, I believe that every born again member of the body of Christ is a paradox in themselves. I believe each one of you Methodist and Presbyterian and Lutheran that never had experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit was in some formal church. Listen how he puts this. Was in some formal church that did not believe in the genuine new birth and has now received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's a perfect example of a paradox because something happened to you that changed your whole being and anyone could look at that and know what a paradox is, a miracle. You think about that, anybody could look at somebody that's been changed and know that they come out of drug addiction, know they come out of their religious dogma, know that they come out of their denominational system, look at somebody like that and know that there's a miracle that took place in that person's life because God got a hold of them and changed them. To be changed is a miracle. If you've been changed this afternoon, God has worked a miracle in your life. That's a miracle being worked. It's a miracle that the Holy Ghost can take a sinner and change him. It's a miracle that God can do that. A miracle, because so, you, you can't do it your own self. You couldn't lay down your cigarettes and lay down your old life and make yourself change. Only God can do that. It's only something that the Holy Spirit can do. Brother Ram, he told this story about... He was counseling this young young German man that he wanted to marry this, this, this little girl, and he, he treated her wrong somehow. And Brother Bram, Brother Bram said there was a fine young man, very fine boy. He was going with a little girl, very fine little girl out of a fine family. And this boy all of a sudden come up with some kind of an idea, and he just walked away. He did something wrong to the little girl, and as much as promised her to do a certain thing and then didn't do it, and instead of coming to the girl and apologizing like a gentleman should do, he, it just wasn't in him 
to do it. You see, as much as you try to do right, if it's not in you to do it, it won't work. And you see this young man that Brother Brown is talking about using as an example here. He wasn't equipped with what? With the life, with the life on the inside, the, the miracle work in life, the kind of miracle work in life that would change. You see, he wasn't changed yet. And because he wasn't changed, he couldn't go to that girl and apologize. He couldn't go to her and make it right. You see, he wasn't equipped. You see, why Brother Branham laid so many times down, why, how important it is to be born again first before you're married, before you're married. Because once you get married and you're not born again, you won't be able to apologize. You won't, you'll be all stubborn. You'll have all that pride and stuff. And it'll just make everything miserable. You've got to be born again before you enter into something like that. He said, therefore, the boy was a Christian. He was a Christian as far as a believer. He had repented and had been baptized and had his position among the believers, but yet had not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No matter how much he thought he had, no matter how much he thought he had, yet the life was not there. The life that would make him live the life of a Christian that would that the, I'm talking about the life that would make somebody stop living in fornication or adultery. The life that would make somebody stop drinking the life that would make somebody stop carousing. I'm, I'm, pre I'm coming down to the home level tonight. I'm preaching about do you have that kind of a life in you tonight? Do you, that kind of a life that will make you straighten up no matter how much he thought he had it. Yet the life was lacking in him. And he said the father raised up and said, my son went to the altar. He was baptized correctly. Now, listen, now, now the father is making all these excuses. That's how so many times the parents will do. The parents will jump in and say, well, yeah, but my son was baptized. Yeah, but my son goes to church. Yeah, but my child, my child this and all that. And the parents, if we'll get away, if we get out of the way sometimes, God can do, can do something. That's, like I was saying this morning, that's why I like camps. <coughs> Because, you know, you can get these kids to go to camp and the mama and daddy ain't there to interfere. The kids can make their own decision. They're not going up the scene because mama and daddy forced them to do it. They're not, they're not going up to the altar because mama and daddy pushed them up there. But they're there to make their own decision. And mama and daddy are out of the way so that they can do something. Many times mama and daddy gets in the way and just messes everything up. And he said, the father raised up and said, my son went to the altar. He was baptized correctly in the name of Jesus Christ. Excuse me. In the name of Jesus Christ and water baptism in the pool. You see, sometimes sometimes you can't rely on what mom and daddy says. You got to have your own experience. You got to have your own experience. He said, I know my son has come to Christ. And Brother Ram said that may be all right. All the outward motions. He might be identified as a believer with the believers. But until he is regenerated, born again. I did, now listen to this. I know this hurts. I know a lot of people disagree with this. But he said, I advise that young man to never marry a woman, to never marry a woman. He'll make hell on earth for her until that gentle, sweet, forgiving spirit of Christ comes in. Now, now you're going to have people get married, but he said he's going to make hell on earth for her. It's going to be hell on earth for somebody to get married if they're not born again because their life is not there. The life that has changed them from an old carnal somebody, carnal man that wants to look at every woman on the beach that walks by, a carnal woman that wants to not, not serve her husband and not do what's right. A carnality, God, the miracle working life of the Holy Spirit will take all the carnality out of you. That's what a, being a real Christian is about. He said, then that will be a paradox in itself to take the very nature of a boy that's bred between father and mother. And yet in his intellectuals, he is trying his best to overcome it. He can't do it. He'll never overcome it. Christ will have to overcome it. When he lets Christ in, then he's already overcome then. It'll be a perfect paradox when a man is born of the spirit of God. Do you realize what's happening when you get born of the Spirit of God? When you're born of your natural birth, you come into the world with your, with your natural genes of your mama and daddy. You come into the world with your natural genes and, and you're going to act like this German boy did. He had all that stubbornness and pride like, like his German ancestors did. He had all that stuff that came down from his parents. But when you get the new birth, God gives you a different set of genes. He starts aligning your character with his genes. He starts taking over your life. He 
starts claiming your life by the word. The more word you hear, it's like God staking something on you and saying, this is mine, and this is mine, and this is mine, and this is mine, until he totally takes you over. He takes you over. That's what he wants to do is swallow you up in himself, swallow you up until you're a living tabernacle of Jesus Christ, Christ made manifest in your members. You see, he's taking you over by his genes, another set of genes. You see, that's the problem with, you know, a lot of ministers have a problem with people looking at horoscopes for that reason. We'll go and look at a horoscope. A horoscope might be good for your flesh or whatever. If, if it were, I don't even believe there's no good in horoscopes. To be honest, I don't believe there's no good. But if there, if, if there were any good, maybe it might be good for your flesh. But we don't care about the flesh as Christians. We, we, you want to find you want to find out about your mama, your, your, where you, the genes from where you came from. Go look back to the Word. The Word is what tells you how to live. It tells you how to do, how to dress, how to clothe, how to walk, how to line up with God, what God wants you to do. Horoscopes, my... Horoscopes don't do nothing for a Christian. What good would a horoscope do for a Christian? What good would a horoscope do for somebody that, that's not born again trying to figure out who they should marry or when they should get married, when they should do all this kind of stuff? Look into the Word of God and find out, find out what the Word of God says about things. Listen, I, I know sometimes that's hard preaching, but it's, it's the truth. It's the truth. We got to get back to the Word to find out what the Word says. So many times we lean upon our own natural self. We lean upon what our own, our own natural genes can do. I want to know what the Spirit of God can do in my life because I believe in miracles. I believe in a miracle working God, a miracle working God that come, can come upon the scene and take a sinner and make a saint out of them. Take a sinner and make a preacher out of them. Take a sinner and make somebody that God can tabernacle himself in and walk and use. So make somebody a deacon, a song leader, somebody that's a real upstanding citizen and in the community. <coughs> Brother Brown said, I've seen critics stand, stand off and make fun and carry on of a Holy Ghost revival. And after a while, God get a hold of that same man and change him. And here he stands right in the pulpit preaching the same thing that he once hated. It's a paradox how that God can take the unbeliever and make a, mirror, a believer out of him and make a believer out of him. That's a miracle, friends. That's a miracle. He said, something, something happened to you. Something happened to you that changed your whole being. Something happened to you that changed you. And anyone could look at that and know what a paradox is. A miracle. <coughs> Why? All because the word got a hold of your life. Now, Brother Bram said, it's a paradox that the word holds everything together. In Hebrews 11, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Brother Brown talked about how you could look out on the, and if you could look out in the galaxy and go like 150 million light years and just go and go and go and then come back another, another 150 million years back. We'd be gone. He said we'd be gone from the earth 50 years. And how can our little, how can our little minds understand something like that? Our little ant brains. I, I put pictures in my notes just to kind of jog my memory. And I got a picture of a little ant brain here. Because <laughs> that's, that's our little ant brain is trying to understand things. How can your little ant brain understand how that, how that God can change your life? How does he do it? How does it, well, we probe at it and try to figure it out, but it's a paradox because you can't explain it by scientific understanding. You can't explain it by your reasoning. All you know is that something got a hold of you and changed you. And one day you were like this, and the next day you were like this, or maybe the next year or however long it took, but something changed you, and you're a miracle. He said, he's talking about, they're talking about looking out into the galaxies and everything. He said they broke in to find out eternity. They say that John Glenn, the astronaut that went around it, never taken one second off of his life. Even the speed that he was traveling, about 1,700 miles. So then, see, we broke into eternity. We're an earthbound people that knows just inches and so forth. When you break into that unknown, you can't fathom that. Our minds are not comprehensive. Our little minds are not comprehensive enough to understand. We, we couldn't. We couldn't fathom what it means to get into that. But we know that it's true. We know it's true. We don't understand all the ins and outs of how it happened, but we know it's true. And that's what a paradox is. 
He so something, something beyond our comprehension is what framed everything up. Something beyond what we can imagine is what's holding the world together, the universe together. Something beyond, what is it? It's the miracle of life. What life? God's life, eternal life. Life is holding everything up. That life that's holding everything up is the same life that can come and change an individual. He said, Einstein said, there's only one sensible thing to say about the world. By faith, we understand that God framed the world together, see? And the world standing there at space, it had to come from somewhere. Now, this is what Einstein really literally said. He said, every scientist becomes convinced that the laws of nature manifest the existence of a spirit vastly superior to that of men. Somewhere out there, he said, I don't understand it, but there's something out there where everything came from. This firm belief in a superior mind that reveals itself in the world of experience represents my conception of God. And Einstein said, behind all the discernible concatenations, there remains something subtle, intangible, and inexplicable. Veneration for this force is my religion. To that extent, I am in fact, point of fact religious. So Einstein, with all his scientific knowledge, had to, had to acknowledge there was something out there that was holding everything up. That's something out there that's holding everything up. That's that thing that got a hold of your life and changed you. How it stands in space. <coughs> How everything stands in space, but we find out here that Joshua, Joshua stopping the sun. Joshua stopped the sun with his word. Now that's a paradox. He said it's a paradox, but God did it anyhow. What by a man, not a God, not some great angel coming down from heaven. A man with faith in the mission that he was given to take that land. The word of God was behind it. I give you this land and everywhere the soles of your foot shall set upon that I give you. It's yours. Now, how did he do it? How how did he unleash the power of life, that miracle working power to stop the sun? Now, Brother Branham, lays, he, he lays an outline out for us that we can follow. <laughs> I'm laughing because, you know, sometimes in the middle of the sermon, everybody takes a nap and then they wake up later. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. Get your, get your rest out. No, we, were, we were talking to a minister that one time, and he said, you know, sometimes people fall asleep because, you know, they, they have a hard time at home. They have a hard time sleeping the night before, and they get in church, and there's a peace there. There's a comfort that, that you can't find anywhere else. Maybe sometimes people need, need that little place where you kind of get you. Get you. So I, I give grace a little bit. <laughs> But the achievement, listen, listen to how Brother Brown lays this out. He said the achievement he was trying to do. See, he, had, he, he was trying to do something. His enemy, now if you go back and read this Bible story about how, how this happened, he, uh, there, there was a city named Gabon that had allied themselves with Israel. Because honestly, they got a little bit scared. And they said they saw Israel destroying all these other cities and all these other places. And they said, well, okay, we're going to, you know what? We're going to ally ourselves with Israel. Don't Please don't attack us. Then another king rose up and he, he, he came after Gabon. So here comes Joshua. He comes, he go, goes to defend Gabon. And he comes on the scene and, and God begins to work up a mighty, there, you can read the story about how they, they, were, they were striking the enemy down and they were driving them out and God began to rain hailstones down on them. Hailstones big enough to, you know, a lot of times we go out in the yard and we're worried about the in, our insurance claim because it might dent our car a little bit. But these hailstones were knocking people down and killing them. And, and, and Joshua began to look on the situation and he saw them running for their lives and, and, but yet the sun was going down. So he, he knew he knew that God had given them that land for an inheritance and, and defeating those enemies was part of the promise that God had given him. So he looked at that. In other words, he had, he had a purpose in his mind. It wasn't, he wasn't just randomly speaking to the sun, but there was a purpose. He began to look with desperation. The sun's going down and the moon's coming up and I, something's, something's got to happen. Otherwise, we're going to loot. We're going to go into the next day where they're going to go be able to hide at night. They're going to be able to get away. We got to kill these enemies. <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't willing to let one of the enemy go get away. He wasn't let think about how that's how we should be with our with our, all of our, our, our cancer problems and our, our problems with our eyesight and things. If God said it, let's pursue it. Let's if you've got the if you've got the promise of God backing you up. Have, let's have the faith that Joshua did. If God said that you can have it, 
Like, I was thinking as Brother Aaron was preaching this morning, as he was talking about the children of Israel going through the wilderness, if God, if God was able to heal them as they went through the wilderness, to give them everything that they need, whatever, what about us? God wants you to be healed in your body. He doesn't want not one of us to be infirm in our body. He wants to, us to go into the rapture believing and, and, and change. He wants us to be, he wants you to be healed so you can serve him. He wants you to, he, he don't want ministers with vocal cord problems so that you can't preach. He wants you to be able to preach. He wants you to be able to think. He wants you to be able to serve him with every capacity in your being. So when you come like that, that's how Joshua came. He knew that God had laid the promise out there and it was God. God wanted him to defeat the enemy. And that's why he was able to speak because he knew what God wanted done with the word. You see why it's so important to come to a place where you know what God wants done with the word? I believe the bride is coming to a place where she knows how to get born again, what the, the born again experience is, what the word does to you, what, the, what effect the word has, what, what that life in you that's been doing all this time, what that is. She knows what's taking place and she knows what God wants done with the word. And that's why Joshua was able to speak. He said the achievement he was trying to do, see, his enemy was routed and he knew. If the sun ever set, them kings would get together and they'd come back upon him with double forces. And Brother Bram said, whatever God did, I don't know. But the sun stood still, the moon over Agilon, because a man, a human being, a human being was in the line of duty. Now, now see, the point is, nobody, maybe nobody can explain that, but it happened. It happened. Joshua probably didn't even know how it happened, but he knew it happened. Because they fought and they fought another day while the sun was standing up. Now, maybe you have some, maybe you can find some quotes to explain how it happened, but you might be missing the point. It's not that you know how everything happened. It's just that you believe God's word and trust in him and, and believe that there's a miracle working God that can change things. You see, so he had, he had what, he had a reason. He had a reason for doing that. Brother Brown said, of course, you got to have a reason for it. You can't have faith unless you got some reason. As I tried to say last night, some people's faith is in their textbook. Some people's faith is in something else, but depends on where your faith is. We, uh, me and Brother Curtis were walking through a Christian bookstore the other day, and, and they got, there's all kinds of books that you could look and say, well, I got faith in this book. I got faith in this man. There was a book on Elijah. I got faith in this man's interpretation of Elijah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I, you know, I got faith in Brother Branham's interpretation of Elijah. I got faith in what this Bible says about Elijah. Yeah. I got faith in this. So having faith in a textbook is one thing, but having faith in the word of God, yeah. here's your reason. Yeah. The reason is God promised. God, he said, he, he promised that he would heal you. Yeah. He promised that he would save you. Right. So if you have a reason, and is it his will? And he said, I want to believe God's word. What he says is true. Then I've got to see whether it's his will or not. His will and his will is his word. Like Romans 12, 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How? By the word of God to prove his will, to prove his will out. What we have is will. The Bible says in Psalm 33, the counsel of the Lord, his word standeth forever. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever the thoughts of his heart to all generations. We've got the counsel of the Lord. Do, do you realize how perplexing that is to people? You, you, you want to find out the will of God and you, and you go and, and, you, and you, pray, you might pray and, and, and maybe the Lord will send you a, a something supernatural. Maybe he'll give you a dream, but that dream might be of the devil. Maybe he'll give you, maybe he'll let you see a light, but it might, might be false. Maybe it might be false. You see, you've got to take everything back to the word. You've got to compare it because his word is his will. And somebody say, well, I, I, I believe the Lord is leading me to do a certain thing, but yet they're not coming to church and they're not, they're not uh, doing what the word says. The word is his will. Yes, right. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he, hath, he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. The will, the will of the father is his word. And if you're walking in the word, you're walking in his will. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is in 1 Kings chapter 13 where the prophet comes on the scene and he, God tells him to go down and to prophesy. His prophecy is that one day a little boy is going to be born, will be born named Josiah. 
and he's going to tear down all the altars of the Lord. And he said he, he, during his prophecy, he's prophesied that the altar that he's prophesying over is going to be rent where they're, they're worshiping false gods. And he makes his prophecy and you can go ring it, read it in first First Kings chapter 13, lots of different things happen and they get upset with him and go fight him. And then on the way home, God told him, don't turn to the right hand or to the left hand. You see, he had the will of the Lord. God told him his word what to do. He said, don't you turn to the right hand or to the left hand, but you just go home. And out of the bushes comes another prophet and says, I, the, the Lord told me, the Bible says he's told him a lie. He said, the Lord told me to tell you to come to my house. And he had maybe a, a see, see, you can't look at supernatural vindications necessarily. You got to take everything back to the word. Everything has got to go back to the word. Even if even if a, a prophet comes out, what if a prophet were to tell you you don't need to go to church no more? What if a prophet were to come out and say, well, well, we don't believe in the fivefold ministry anymore? What, what would you take? Would you take would you rip Ephesians four out of your Bible? Would you rip all of the scriptures out of your Bible that talks about the forsake not the assembling together of yourselves even as you see the day approaching? Would you take that, by, that part of your... That, see, see how you got to take everything back to the Word. Even if a prophet comes out of the bushes and tells you something contrary, you take everything back to the Word. It's all, it all goes back to the Word. And so Brother Brown in the message Perseverance, he said you must first find the will of God before you can do the will of God. You must first know what His will is in the matter and then don't turn it loose and in the token he said now let me tell you by his word he cannot go contrary to that word he's already purchased your desire if it's according to his will and his will is to heal his will is to give you your desire so if you know what his will is, his will is for you to be healed in your body. Even if you're maybe slumbering this afternoon and not, not paying attention to the words that are being spoken, but yet it's still the truth. The truth, his will is for you to be healed. His will is be, for you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. His will is for you to be, for your, for your nature to be changed, to be like him. And then you got, if you have the right motive, he said, then if his will if it's will, I got to go check out my objective to it and my motive in doing it. If I do it because I say, well, I'm going over the mountain here. There's a mountain before me. There's a million people on that side perishing. <coughs> I got a hundred million over here I'm preaching to. Well, if I can't get over, around, or under the mountain or nothing, and yet something in my heart keep telling me, go over the mountain, go to them. Now, Jesus said, they shall move this mountain. If God wants you to go to the other side of that mountain and your motive is right and your reason is right and everything's lining up, you're going over that other side of that mountain. So it's time to speak the word. Speak the word. What are you talking about, Brother Bob? I'm talking about say, by his stripes, I am healed. By his stripes, I'm healed and speak it. What are you speaking? You're speaking what God already spoke. You're saying what he's already said. And you're, when you speak it, you're, you're following your confession. Your body will follow your confession into what you say. Speak it and watch, the, watch it come to pass. Say, I believe that my body is going to be changed. Speak it and walk into it. Now, the first thing I'll have to say, brother, I said, now, if, you, if your motive is money, if I go over here, this side can only pay me so much. And over there, see, my motive is not my, right. My objective is not right. Or, or what if I say, well, I don't care about money, but if, if I go over there, they're gonna be a, they'll build me up a big monument, a big old statue. And I can look, you know, he said, brother, I'm the great missionary. This, this still, my motive is not right. If you're looking for popularity, if you're looking for money or those, those kind of things. But if your motive is to seek God's word fulfilled, then speak it and go forward. Speak it. He said, but when I don't care, when I don't care if they ever know who went over there to the other side of the mountain. When I don't care about my popularity or my reputation, when I don't care, that all I know is that he's just in my heart. Then I'll speak to that mountain and it will happen. Then I'll speak to that mountain and it'll happen. It will happen. It will happen. Why? Because that will unleash the life of Christ. It'll unleash the miracle work in God. God can move then. When somebody that's filled up with Christ speaks his word, something will happen. He said, see, your motive and your objective depends on who you are and what business. He said, that's where the church misses it so far. They get worked up in an emotion. And first thing you know, in enthusiasm, you don't stop to check it back here again. Check there. Stop to check it back here again. 
Check there for sure. Then it's thus saith the Lord. See whether it's right. You see what God is, God's molding us into. He's bringing up, building us up precept by precept, word by word into a place where we know what God wants done with the word. We know whether God wants us to go to that mountain, the other side of that mountain. We know whether God wants us to be healed or not. God wants you to be healed. God wants you to be healed and he's still a miracle working God. He said, if you have the right reason, the right, listen, the right reason, the right objective, and you know what his will is, the mountain will move. If you've got the right reason and the right objective, and you know what his will is, and you've got his will, the mountain will move. Joshua had a commission to go over and to take that land, and God caused a great paradox because all of those things were met. He had a reason, he had an objective, and he, it was God's will, and he knew it. Now listen, Moses had a commission to bring those people out of Egypt to that mountain. There it was in the line of duty. Moses began to cry unto God when he said the, saw the pillar of fire hanging up there. And there come Pharaoh's chariots, and he cried, and God said, Why are you crying to me? I commissioned you to do it. Speak and go forward. It was God's commission. You remember, if you go back and read the sermon, Why Cry Speak, or listen to it, that whole sermon, Brother Brown's building up to the place. He's building all the background of Moses, all the things that happened in his life. And finally, he got to the culminating point. Uh, aren't, don't you know what I called you for? And there Moses is crying. And he said, don't cry to me. Just speak. Because he had a commission. And a commission is an instruction, a command or duty given to a person or group of people. A formal written authorization to perform various acts and duties. And we've got a formal written authorization to perform various acts and duties. This is our authorization. What kind of authorization? We've got the authority that in my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm them, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We've got God's written authority to speak his word, to perform his word to believe his word, to go and see the miracle working life of Christ work miracles. <clears throat> the trouble of it is today, Brother Ram said, the churches speak, look like, say, well, what did Moody say? What did Sankey say? But the question is, what did God say? <laughs> you can go into the Christian bookstore and look at all the different commentaries on the wall of, of A.W. Pink and E.W. Bullinger and they go on and on and Clarence Larkin and what did they say? But what did God say? That's why the message is so, so such a blessing in this hour that God has he's downloaded the revelation, the correct interpretation of the whole Bible to us. That when you get into the message, it's like you get a all of a sudden you get a Bible Ph.D. <laughs> You, you, you get a supernatural understanding of everything from Genesis to Revelation because, because we know what God said. Now we, know, now we know how to baptize. We know how to, how many, whether there's one God or, or three. We know uh, from the end from the beginning. And, and, and Brother Ram said, speak and say what God said. Amen. Let's go forward. Not good look. You know, that's what the commission to the church was. Speak and go forward. Yeah. Don't ever go back. Mm. Christians don't go back. We go forward. Right. <coughs> because the same one that was with Moses is with the ministry of today. Speaking the word over the people. If you'll just speak the word, the mountain will move. If you'll speak it, the mountain will. Speak what? Speak it. His will is for you to be delivered. His will is for you to be born again. His will is for you to grow in grace and knowledge just like Jesus did. His will is for you to come into maturity. His will is for your body to be healed. I hope nobody leaves this afternoon wondering if God wants you to be healed. That's his will is for your body to be healed. His will is for you to have peace in your mind. So if you're troubled this afternoon, troubled in your mind and can't sleep, tossing and turning at night on your bed of pain, his will is for you to be delivered of that. So speak it and go forward. I believe that that's your will for my life and walk into your confession. Speak it. Listen, 
Moses got to a place where he was there and the waters were all in front of him and God told him to speak and he spoke the word and the waters parted. He spoke and the Egyptians couldn't explain it with all their science, with all their technology. They couldn't understand how the waters parted. They tried to ride in there and and impersonate some things and ride through there and get to the other side and the waters closed in on them because it was a paradox. They couldn't explain it, but yet it happened. Something happened. God moved that water aside because a man got a hold, got in the channel of God and spoke his word. And you've got that same commission that Moses had to speak the word and go forward. Amen. You think about all those, all those children of Israel going through that water and then going through the wilderness. Two million people in the middle of a paradox and not realizing that God was working a miracle. Wondering, wondering as they walked through the wilderness when God gave them water from a rock and God gave them food from heaven. Wondering if God still loved them and they were right in the middle of a paradox. Could you be in the middle of a paradox right now? Wondering, what, wondering if God still works miracles when God's opened the windows of heaven for you. They wondered for, if God still loved them. They kept longing for their leeks and onions and Egypt. They were wondering if God really was with Moses. Wondering if God really was with the ministry. I wonder how many people today are wondering if God really is on the scene. Wondering if that really is God speaking through the ministry. Wondering if they really could defeat the giants or not. After all that God had done for them. After all the miracles that they had seen. Going after golden calves. And yet they were actually walking in a miracle. They had a smitten rock that followed them. They had the water coming from the rock. All they had to do was walk out and gather food off the ground every morning. Maybe it took a little bit of time to gather up the manna off the ground and pick it up, but they were living in a miracle and they didn't realize it. And the paradox is you are a miracle. God is changing your life as you receive the word. Do you recognize that you're a miracle? It was a paradox when Joshua and Caleb stood strong and believed that God was able. Two of them, Brother Bam preached that sermon, one in a million, because there was two million out there, and one in a million believed against all the odds. They all came against them because why? They began to look for scientific reasoning. They began to look for something that, with, their, with their intellectual knowledge that they could grasp a hold to. But a paradox is something that's beyond, be, past finding out, beyond anything that you can understand with your own knowledge. He said it was a paradox to see a handful of people, unarmed almost, but what they had picked up on the deserts and where they had chased other men probably with such as old rakes and saws and whatever they could get a hold of when they finally came into the promised land. A paradox to see a bunch of people like that with rakes and saws come and take over the enemy and sweep through the land. A paradox to see the walls of Jericho fall to the ground. It was a paradox when Noah preached the word to a scientific age. Noah had a commission. What was his commission? That destruction's coming. Isn't that what Malachi 4? It talks about that just before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, God will send a message. And God sent a message back then that destruction is coming to get in the ark. What's our ark now? To get into Christ. And Noah preached to an intellectual world like we're preaching to now a day when they were farther advanced in science than we are now. He said we could never build a pyramid. They say they they built that pyramid by by a bunch of people pushing it up a a, a sledge or something. Brother Brown talked about how that you could get a train car out on the train tracks and put grease grease the wheels all up underneath it and put a whole bunch of people behind that and you won't be able to move that train car. And it's got wheels. In other words, they had all kinds of scientific understanding. They had way more scientific advancement than we do. And they had all that scientific knowledge with all their instruments to look up into the heavens and say, there ain't no rain. Where's the rain going to come from? But yet God said it. You, what, what's the point, Brother Bob? We know all this kind of stuff. We, we've, heard, we've rehearsed all this in our mind before. But the point is that you can't reason out a body change in your mind how it's going to happen. But yet God said it. You can't reason out in your mind how God 
God's going to heal that hip problem, how God's going to heal that back problem. You can't reason it out in your mind, but yet God's word said it. And that's a paradox. A paradox is when a miracle happens and you can't explain it. How are you going to explain it when you go and, and you tell people at work, I don't know what happened on the cast can, but something happened and it ain't the same as it was before I took the cast can, before I took the x-ray. I don't know what happened. All I know is I ain't the same. All I know is God came in and took over. Noah only. Listen, they had all that science, but Noah only had the word of the Lord in the face of all that science. Noah only had the word of the Lord. Noah had a revelation of what the will of God was to do. Noah had a revelation that he needed to build that ark, and he went through three pools, just like we're going through three pools. God told him to build that ark, and he got started, and then he labored, and he labored, and he labored, and then finally the day came when they went in there, and God shut the door in a third pool. They were in there, and he was, maybe it came time to look out there, and all those that had rejected the message, and the third pool were preaching to the lost. They, they wanted to get in then, but the door was shut. <coughs> Noah only had the word of the Lord in the face of all their science against all their instruments. He knew it was going to rain. He knew destruction was coming. He knew the way of escape. He knew he was going to build an ark. He knew. He knew what God wanted done with his word. He knew. He knew it was going to rain. He knew the recipe to get out. He knew to build an ark. He knew how to build an ark. The brothers were telling me that, 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 that they went, some of y'all went to the, see that, that ark re, uh, model that they build up north. And, and you can walk around and look. I haven't been, but they tell me how amazing it is to see, to think about a man that would know, have the knowledge to build something that, like that. That God would architect something like that and give him a revelation of how to get out of here, of how to go to another world, another a world without sin, a world that had been cleaned off, a world that had been purged. And yet Noah couldn't prove a thing. Noah couldn't prove that his message was right. How would he prove it? <laughs> did, Noah have any, did Noah have a pillar of fire come down out of the cloud? Did Noah have any kind of scientific proof? He, all he had was a message that God had given him, a message that God proved one day to be right. And you know what? Those people, they had to either believe what he was saying was right or they didn't believe it. They had two choices, either believe what he said was right or not believe it. And you've got that same choice today. <sighs> one day it'll be proven out. But for now, you've got, to, you've got to take it or leave it. You've got to accept it by the preaching of the word. Whether or not this matches up by the Bible or not, Noah said it's going to happen anyhow, see? And it rained. That was a paradox, see? Something that could not be explained. But God shook the earth around just in condition so it would rain. So you see, it was a paradox for Noah to do that. <clears throat> Why did God do it that way? God did it that way. Because he was going to do it again in the last days. He's doing the same thing again. Noah preached to a scientific age of a bunch of unbelieving people, people that didn't even eventually, weren't even swayed by his message. And the Bible says in Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in, the, as, as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Listen, they were, they, were, they were going through life until Noah went into the ark. There was not a lot of bad things happening. They just they went into the ark one day and it caught everybody off guard and it'll catch people off guard today because the Bible says that they were eating and drinking. They were having their parties. They were marrying and giving in marriage. They're going about life, building, putting up skyscrapers, tearing down skyscrapers, building houses, building new subdivisions, going along, doing the same thing. And all of a sudden, the Son of Man comes on the scene and people don't recognize it. People are called away. The Bible says, listen, the Bible says it's going to be a secret catching away. Two will be in the bed. One will be caught. One will be, two will be in the field. One will be gone. One will be left. Two will be, two will be working. Two will be at the office. Two will be, two will be wherever. And one will be gone because it'll be a secret. But it was the same, it's the same thing happening today that it happened with, with, with Noah in Noah's day. Noah, Noah preaching to a lot of evil, scientific people in the most, the evil, think about it. 
all that understanding that they had. And now we're in a day where we got the internet, we got social media, all these things is happening all over again. Ezekiel said, uh, uh, Ecclesiastes, it's, there's nothing new under the sun. God will do it again in the most evil, scientific, intellectual age. God will send a message that cannot be proven by their intellect. A paradox. A paradox that cannot be proven by, scienti by scientific knowledge. And his message is still the same, to get in the ark. Brother Ram preached a message to get into the ark because he knew that there was going to be somebody to get in. You, you think about how hard it was for Noah to get people on the ark. He preached and he preached and he preached for a hundred years. And it was, it was far easier to get the animals on the ark because the Spirit of God could just move over those animals and here they come. One day God, uh, Noah would look out there and, and see all those animals coming two by two and seven by seven for the, cl the clean animals. And all, they were coming and coming and coming. And I, I wonder if you wondered, why are, all, why are all the animals coming? But yet I've preached and I've preached my heart out for a hundred years. And only eight people are on this ark. He wanted to see that ark filled. I wonder maybe if he built it so big because he wanted to get it full. But yet nobody responded. It's going to be so, you listen, you wait till the end of this message. Brother Brown nails it down. How few, because he's looking, he's looking for that life. Where is the life of Christ? Where is the life as it was in the days of Noah? To think <clears throat> if they wanted to get on the ark, they had to come by Noah's message. The only way, the only way to get in that door was to believe what that man preached. That was the only way to get in that ark was to believe what that man preached. And if they would just step into that ark, they would step into another world. It would take a long time to get there, but eventually one, uh, a year later the, the door would open and they'd step out into a world with no, no, no sin and no... Uh, I'm following my type now. I know Noah got drunk and that kind of stuff, but no... All that scientific stuff got, got, was destroyed. The earth was cleaned off and, and God was starting all brand new. And Brother Brown said, we find that in the days of Noah that while he preached, they could hardly believe such a thing as that. Noah believing. Noah was believing for such a thing. But finally the paradox came and it happened. It actually rained. <coughs> the word came to pass then and it's still coming to pass today. He said, let me go with the word, not with some educational program or something somebody has crooked up somewhere. I know God's word will never fail. The word, you see, is everything you need. The word is everything you need. You know, in Acts chapter 3, it says that Peter was talking at the gate beautiful when he, when he, when, when he spoke the words over that man that was, that, that was lame and he spoke to him and he said, and he, he began to preach as they, they began to question out there after he rose from his feet. And he said, he shall send Jesus Christ, which, was, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. The times of restitution of all things. And now, now we're at, a, at that time of restitution of all things, the time of restoration of the word. You, you see all... all uh, the, the, why the, the word is so important, but the word is the word is everything that you need. If if one word off, that Eve believed one word off back then, and it caused them to lose everything, what would the restitution restoration of the word, the restitution of all things, do? It would restore back everything that Eve lost. It would restore everything back. So now the word is the thing that's changing us. It's a paradox. Now, it was a paradox when Israel stood on one side of the hill and Goliath on the other side of the hill. It was a paradox when David was anointed. He was anointed and, and, and he went to, to defeat the, the Goliath. And I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to kind of skim through some things. It was a paradox to fight Goliath with that little sling. David, David went against Goliath with the most weakest weapon he got to show that if you come, if you come with your, your weakness and your frailties and your humility, but yet trust in God, Trust in God with put, put your F-A-I-T-H in J-E-S-U-S like David did with his little sling that God will do the fighting for you. Because David knew that giants had been defeated there before. He knew that Joshua had come through that place before and he had defeated giants. And so he came with confidence, believing that if God was able to defeat giants then that God was still able to do it. 
Yeah. We can come with that same faith, believing that if God was able to defeat giants back in the days of Paul, it's been done before. It's been, if it was done in the days of Irenaeus and Martin and Luther, then God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever if we'll just fall in behind the word. It was a paradox, but why, did, why, was able, why was David able to slay that giant? Because the spirit of the Lord was on him. Because he had been anointed with that anointing oil that Samuel poured over him and the spirit of the Lord was on him. And that's the thing that does the work. That's the thing. That's what gave Samson his power. The little scrawny runt that was able to lift up the gates of the city. Why? Because the spirit of the Lord was on him. The spirit of the Lord is that life. It was a par It's a paradox to see life. And life is that paradox. Brother Bram said it was a paradox when God caused the woman to conceive. It was a paradox that how God, the eternal that fills all time and eternity, could come down and become one little baby crying in a manger. A paradox that God would put his life in a little child crying in a manger. Ain't little, crying in a manger. And it's a paradox. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about life. Life is a paradox. Brother Bram actually said that in his sermon. He says, we're talking about life. And, and he said, the virgin birth seems almost easier to believe than the natural birth. Who determines what it's going to be? And he, he talks about a germ trying to find its way to the egg. And you think it would go from point A to point B, the shortest distance. But yet he said, something unknown to science determines it. Determines which egg, which sperm, which germ is going to meet match up. Something that science can't explain. Why is it the one in the back and not the one in the front? Something moves it. Something unknown to science determines it. That ain't a paradox. What is? Point to point is the closest way around. We understand, but not that time. God determines it. You, you, you think about how God actually, Brother Brown said he bred this one to this one, this one to this one, because he's, it's God bringing something into being. God knew that one day you would be here, and he's the one that did it. His life. His life has mo moved everything. That's the paradox. He said it was a paradox. It was a paradox when he died at the cross. Why would that be a paradox? Because he was alive and yet he gave his life for you so that you could have his life. It was a paradox when he died on the cross and it was a paradox when he gave that life on the day of Pentecost. The Bible said that he and John, Acts 4, was ignorant and unlearned. A, ignorant, a paradox that he would give the Holy Ghost to a bunch of unlearned people that didn't know nothing about nothing. They couldn't even write their own names. That's a paradox. You see, so many people think that you've got to know, you got to know all the Hebrew. John Wesley even said, if, if you don't know Hebrew and Greek, then you shouldn't even be preaching. And people get that in their minds that if you don't know all sorts of intellectual things and you can't know God. But if you can, if you die to your own abilities and die to your own understanding, then that life will spring up within you. It doesn't matter how much you know within your own mind. It's how much you know of Christ. It was a paradox how that then people up in that upper room there afraid of the Jews and had walked with Jesus. But when the Holy Ghost came, they wasn't afraid no more. And what made the difference? was the life. The life is what made the difference. The life is what made the difference with David, with Samson, with Joshua. That's what made the difference. And you, you see, when you got that life, you can't separate the man from the life. Brother Brown said, now listen to this, y'all. Brother Brown said in 1963, he said, the real believer, no matter what, they are thoroughly satisfied. They are thoroughly convinced because the life that's in them has already become Christ. It is Christ. It's no more you, but Christ that lives in you. When you've got, the new, when you've got that life, you can't separate that life from you anymore. Because now it's yours. It's in you. It's part of you. And you can't tear it apart. It's you. Christ is in you. That's the mystery of God revealed. Christ in you. The mystery is Christ is living in you and it's something in you that can't be separated. You are Christ and Christ is you. You're both wound up together, a masterpiece family. Just join, vulcanize so much together that you, you can't tell one from the other. That's why Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. 
who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ is your life. And that's that thing that's changing you. That's the paradox that's past all scientific understanding, past finding out that Christ is living in you. Colossians 1.27, this is my favorite scripture in the Bible. To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. So nothing, if you've got that life, nothing can separate you from that life. Paul said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Can a sword separate you from that life? Once that life is given to you, it's, it's part of you. You're the same. Nothing is going to separate you from that. Amen. That's right. Right. Can death separate you from it? Nothing is going to separate it. And, and he said, we take life so commonly. He said, we Pentecostals, we're taking God too commonly. The whole thing, we just let it pass by. What? Life. That life is still present in the church. He said, that pillar of fire is still alive today among us after all these thousands of years and still it's here. It's a paradox. Yes. Now, you might not be able to see it this afternoon, but the pillar of fire is still here. How do I know? Because his, where the word is, the life of God is present. Yes, right. the, word, the word is even how Elijah knew when he told Elisha, he, or he told his, his servant Gehazi, he told him that the, the chariot, the, there's more with us than with them, with them. And he knew that because he was looking to the word. He knew that the Bible said, the word said that the angels of God are encamped about those that fear him. And he was looking to the word. That's how we know that God is with us because his word says so. Amen. Brother Bram said, even the seed in the ground is a paradox. And he talked about how that it comes up. And he said, there's nothing scientifically there to show us there. But just let the sun rock around in its right position. Watch what happens. It comes from somewhere. That's a paradox. What's the paradox of a seed? That there's life in that seed. And the life in that seed is a paradox. So that's what we want to see. We want to see the life. In Ezekiel 9.4, it says, The Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the denomination, for, for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. <laughs> for all the abominations. Somebody, in other words, find me somebody that's got that kind of a life in them. And Brother Ram said, I want you ministers. But if you go back and listen to that sermon, the, the paradox that Brother Ram preached in 1964, where he really laid it out. Listen to how he laid it out so scald. And he said, he, he's looking for the life now. He said, I want you ministers to lay your hands upon that member of your church, you Pentecostal members. In other words, go find somebody. He's given them a challenge. Go find somebody in your congregation that's got that, that kind of life. He said, then when you find this, you come and I'll apologize to you. He said, you find that member of yours that can't rest day and night for crying for the abomination of sins done in the city. 90% of them stay home and say, we love Susie instead. He said, oh, you speak with tongues, sure, jump up and down and shout. That's all right. Nothing against that. Nothing against your organization either. But I'm trying to talk about life. Where's it at? Where's the real Christian life? Where's somebody that really cares about what's preached over the pulpit? Somebody that really wants to be a Christian. Somebody that's concerned about sin in the church. Somebody that when they see people living in fornication and adultery, that, that, ain't, that should not be. That's, that's not right. Somebody that's concerned about the way that you dress and the way that you live. He said, now you show me that member. Look how worldly. He's talking about the, the churches. Look how worldly, how indifferent. Always the outside expresses what's on the inside. By their fruits, they're known. Where is it at? I just ask. Just answer your question before you condemn. See, just ask that question. Where is that life at? Where is the life of Christ at? That's what God wants to see. That's what, that's what the angel there in Ezekiel looking for, to seal, to mark them in the forehead that sigh and cry for the abomination of the city, the ones that have that life. Now, you see, you see why he's stressing this so much. All the Pentecostal denominations and things, they said they had the truth. Many, many, many people in the message, like Brother Aaron was bringing out this morning, many, many people in the message proclaim to have the truth, and they say we've got the truth, but where's the life at? 
Where's the life that when you go home and, uh, and you, are you arguing with your family constantly? Is there peace in your home? Do your kids know that you have that same life? Are you a testimony to the people that you go out in, in your workplace with? Is that life on display? Because that's what the angels are looking for to go seal up. That's what Christ is looking for. The life. The life is what is changing you. The life is what is bringing up that seed. The life is what will bring you up again if you go down into the grave. And the life is what will change your body. The life. <clears throat> Brother Ram said in this sermon, he said, oh God. Well, let me read this quote first. He said, in expectations, he said, clergyman, could you mark out on your hands 10 people tonight? In this city, the sighing and crying day and night for the wickedness and things that's done in the city. Does anybody in this audience know where you could put your fingers on five people? My, what a challenge. On five people that sigh and cry day and night for the sins and things of the city. You see why Brother Brown put as the, as the comparison, as it was in the days of Noah, yeah, eight souls were saved, but he pointed to the rapture, like Enoch. Enoch was the type of the rapture, one, one. And God, he's saying, he's saying, can you look in your church and find five that are sighing and crying for the abominations done in the city? See, we come to church and we've almost made it like a, like a ritual. We come to church and, and, and yet we go home and sin is still living, uh, effective in our life. We, we ignore the things that, the, that Brother Bram said about how you ain't supposed to be living with somebody that you're married to. You, I, 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 thought, I thought we were supposed to be holding a standard like when Ananias and Sapphira came into the church. That same kind of a standard where you ain't supposed to be doing things that the Bible says are not right. You're supposed to be manifesting the life. You don't even have a, a right to take communion if you're not living that life that other people can look at and see the life of Christ is living in me. You come in church and sit and sit among the congregation of the people of God, but yet the life is God wants to see the life on display. He wants to see the, li the life in you having an effect on your life. And Brother Ram said, oh God, but I look down through it and think, what's the use of even trying? That's a prophet of God looking out at the effect that is like, like Noah. You think Noah ever thought that preaching there at the door of the ark and preached and preached for a hundred years and nobody came but his family. Nobody came. All the animals lined up. All the animals came, but nobody came but his family. And Brother Ram said, what's the use of even trying? He said, but then I look down through there and see a little light here and there. A consecrated Christian praying. Is your life consecrated this afternoon? Are you consecrated that when you get alone with, you want to get alone with God because you're sighing and crying for the abomination done in the city. There's something in you that's groaning and crying out that you want to see God manifested in your life. That it's worth, that it's worth more to you than just knowing about things. But you want to know God. You want Christ in your life. That you're willing to die out to all the things that you hold so dear. That's why Brother Ram said that seed's got to die. For life to come forth, the seed's got to die. Jesus, what did he say? The first thing he said, except a corn of wheat falls into the ground, dies, it abides alone. He showed them how to see him. Die to yourself. Die to your ethics, your creeds, and all this. And when you die and the life comes in, you can't hold that life down anymore. When the resurrection power of Jesus Christ comes into the believer's heart, you can't keep that down. You might bury it in the ground, but one morning it's coming up again. You can't keep it down because the life will have an effect. It will do something in your body. Brother Brown had that conversation with the infidel there at the, at the apple tree. My, my wife and I, it's, it's actually down the road to where my wife's brother lives up there in Kentucky. And we went to the house and talked to the people that live there now and stood at the, at the stump of the apple tree that grew there where Brother Branham had this conversation. Uh, talk about a little humble place in the middle of Kentucky that you wouldn't, now, now it's, it's going down in the history of message believers, that little humble place where Brother Branham talked to the infidel and told him about the intelligence that makes that sap go down in the tree and come up in the spring. 
That it's, he said, you could put a bucket up on the fence, but why don't the bucket, why don't the water go down in the ground if you put it in the bucket? Because, and the man said, oh no, it don't have any life. Life is the thing that makes the difference. And Brother Branham said, I said, there you are. Now you got it. Life is the thing that matters. Life is what will make it come up. He, sees, he said, see, it's life. I said, see, that's God. God is the life. Yes. The life. God is that intelligence that's past all scientific understanding that makes the sap go down in the roots in the winter and makes it come up again in the spring. And that man died that Brother Bram was talking to after he had received that life. And Brother Bram came back a year later and his wife was bawling him out for coming up. And Brother Bram started talking to her and he said, I'm the one that led your, hus- your, your husband to the, to the Lord. And, and she said, forgive me. Forgive me. She said he died. Listen to how he died. He died shouting. Both hands up in the air. Praising God knowing as that leaf come back, as the leaf of that apple tree, as that leaf come back, he'd come back again. See a paradox. Unexplainable. The same life that caused that apple tree, uh, apple tree life to come back in the spring is the same life that gave him confidence at his death to know that one day he was coming back up again. Amen. And Brother Bram said there's many big paradox we could talk about, but let's think of this. He said there's one great, one great paradox coming, the rapture. He said let's all be ready for that one. How do you think we get ready for the rapture? To make sure that that life is in you. Yes, yes. To double check that you're, you're actually matching the word. That what the Bible says. That that life matches what the Bible. That the life in you matches what the Bible says you should be. A Christian walking according to the word. Let's, let's not be like the children of Israel walking through the wilderness. Wondering if we're living in a miracle. Wondering if God still loves us. But recognize that God is working a miracle in your life even now. He said, you know, you know what the life is. It's the Holy Spirit as the musicians come. He said, if you haven't received that Holy Spirit, which is life that was in the first plant that raised up. See Christ, first fruit of those that slept. Now, if that life that was in him, that same spirit is not in you, no matter how nice you try to be, you can't come forth. There's nothing there to raise you up. But if that life is in you, it's going to come forth. It's a miracle when God brings life. It's a miracle when God gave you the new birth and brought life into your soul. It's a miracle. The miracle is his life. Let's stand to our feet and just worship him. If his life is here, if his life is here moving through the building, what do we got to worry about? What do we got to be be afraid of? There's nothing can separate us from the love of God. If If his life, if Christ is in us, there's nothing that can tear us apart from him. Not death, not the sword, not famine, not plagues, not heartache. Nothing can separate us from him because his life is in us. His life is the thing that matters. You love him this afternoon? Amen. Amen. From glory to glory, he's changing me. Changing me. Changing me. His likeness and image to perfect in me. The love of God shown to the world. For He's changing, changing me from earthly things to the heavenly. His likeness you believe that and this image afternoon? to perfect in me. The love of God shown to the world. Aren't you glad He got a hold of you? It did something in your life. Changing me, changing me, changing me. His likeness and image to perfect in me. The love of God shown to the world. For He's changing, changing me from earthly things to the heavenly. 
His likeness and image to perfect in me the love of God shown to the world. From glory to glory, He's changing me, changing me, changing me. His likeness and image to perfect in me the love of God shown to the world. For He's changing, changing me from earthly things to the heavenly. His likeness and image to perfect in me the love of God shown to the world. From glory to glory He's changing me, changing me, changing me. His likeness and image to perfect in me. The love of God shown to the world. For He's changing, changing me from earthly things to the heavenly. His likeness and image to perfect in me. The love of God shown to the world. From glory to glory, He's changing me. Changing me, changing me. His likeness and image to perfect in me. The love of God shown to the world. For He's changing Changing me from earthly things to the heavenly, His likeness and image to perfect in me, the love of God shown to the world. Amen. He's changing us by His miracle working power, His life. You love the Lord this afternoon? Let's just go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Lord God, we're so grateful, Lord, for your grace to us in this hour to give us a message, a message like this that we've heard, to bring your power back into the church, Lord, in fullness, Lord Jesus. We know you're here, Lord. We know you're here with your people, Lord Jesus. We ask, Lord, as they, as they go their different ways, Lord, this afternoon, Lord, that you'll just keep and protect them, Lord Jesus. Let these words echo in their heart, Lord God, and know that you still love them, Lord. To know, remind them that they're walking in a paradox, that they're walking in a miracle, that the miracle-working God is still on the scene. We've, we've got access to a miracle-working God to heal us and deliver us, Lord Jesus. Now let us go forth this week, Lord Jesus, with a song in our heart and a spring in our step and a confession in our mouth, Lord Jesus confessing what you've already spoken, Lord Jesus, and believing it, Lord God. Walk again in your promises, Lord Jesus. We believe it, Lord God. We believe what you've spoken. We thank you, Lord God, for all these things. Bless your people now as they go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You're dismissed. Amen.